Grace and mercy and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Over a hundred years ago, an American psychologist named Joseph Jastrow used a picture to make a point about perspective and creativity. I want you to open your worship folders to page 11. When you look at that picture, what do you see? How many of you, when you look at that picture, see a rabbit? How many of you see a duck? And now that I've shown you both a rabbit and the duck, can you see both of them? Jaster's research indicates that the quicker you can change your perception from one animal to another and see the other animal than the one you saw first, that shows how quickly your brain works and it even says something about your creativity. Maybe you didn't see the animal, the other one, at first, but I would imagine that somewhere, someone... After I told them about the rabbit and the duck, they could look at that picture all day long and they would never be able to see the other animal. When I look at this gospel lesson today, it seems to me that there are some people who fall into that can't see the other animal category. At the same time, there were people that, logically speaking, were the least likely to see things as they really were, and yet those were precisely the people who had an accurate view of things. You know, and not being able to identify a duck or a rabbit, it's not life or death. But not being able to identify Jesus for who he is, That's bigger than life and death. That's the difference of being in heaven or hell for all eternity. And no amount of power, no amount of logic, no amount of determination is ever going to make a difference. It's God's grace, isn't it? God's grace that gives us the ability to correctly identify Jesus as the Savior. It's that very same grace of God that gives us the wisdom to value what is truly valuable. It's the grace of God that gives us the ability to shape and mold our lives into what he wants. When I was writing this sermon, someone came into my office and I I made the comment that I preached on this text So many times in my ministry, it's kind of a struggle to present it in a different, fresh way. I think in the past, I spent a lot of time talking about the wise men, making guesses, educated guesses about who these men were, where they came from, how many gifts or how many of them there were based on the the gifts that they brought. But we can make educated guesses about it, but that's all there ever be is guesses. Because the Bible doesn't really tell us who they were or where they came from or how many of them there were. We know that they were important for some reason because after all, Matthew calls them wise men. Magoi in the original language, the title given to scientists and teachers and priests, astronomers by the Babylonians and the Persians, the very title given to people who had the ability to interpret dreams, even sorcerers. Exactly why Matthew calls them wise, that we don't know for sure. But one thing we do know for sure is they were the last people we would expect to see worshiping at the Savior. They were foreigners, after all. And they were living in an age when 
you didn't find out about the birth of a child. That news didn't spread around the world in an instant because it was posted on social media. Yet somehow, these people far, far away had heard about the birth of this special child. No doubt it was because they were connected to a prophecy. A prophecy about a special star that would appear in the sky that would signal the birth of the Savior. How is that possible? So far away from the home of the prophet who first made that prophecy. Truth be told, it had probably been a while. It had probably been a while since the shepherds worshipped the newborn child, Jesus, in the manger. A few months, a year, maybe two years later now, Verse 11 tells us that when they came to see Jesus, they didn't go to the manger, they were in the house. And the timing of when this happened, that is unclear as well. But what is not unclear is that these wise men from the east knew exactly who Jesus was. Their eyes saw a little baby. But at the same time, they recognized this was a gift from heaven. God's own son sent into this world to be the rescuer and the redeemer from sin. How did they know that? It's not because they were smarter. How do I know that they were worshiping Jesus as the Savior? It's not from the expensive gifts they brought. It's because their hearts were filled with joy. They were overwhelmed with joy, and they fell down on their knees, and they worshiped this child. Isn't it interesting that Herod, King Herod, looked at essentially the same image, and he saw something completely different. He didn't see gift sent from heaven. Savior sent by a loving father into a lost world, a deliverer, a rescuer. Instead, he saw a threat to his power. Someone trying to rob him of his throne, an opportunist seeking to take away his authority. And he had more knowledge and more proximity to the prophecies than these wise men ever dreamed of. His ancestors had converted to Judaism. He had some Jewish blood. He was raised as a Jew, and in an instant, he had chief priests and experts in the law pouring through the scriptures, looking for details about the birth of this child, and yet he failed to see him as the Messiah. Looking at the very same image, he was incapable of recognizing him as the Savior. What about those chief priests and experts in the law? They knew the prophecies. They could compare the prophecies to the birth of this child and know that he met all of those promises. They knew the very birthplace of the Savior and they knew that Jesus was born there. But what I find interesting is this. After they came and reported to Herod what they found out, Matthew doesn't tell us anything else about them. It doesn't tell us that they dug into the scriptures more, that they sought him out. They just moved on with their lives. What that tells me is they looked at this child that the wise men worshipped, that Herod saw as a threat, and they viewed him as totally insignificant. Don't you find that interesting? How could they be that they were all looking at the same thing and they came to entirely different conclusions about him? And again, it wasn't because the wise men were smarter. It wasn't because the wise men were more determined to find out the truth. It wasn't because they came from the right background, the right upbringing, or the right place. It was God's grace. God's grace that gave them the wisdom to see the true identity of this child. It was God's wisdom, not theirs, transferred to them by faith that enabled them to see Jesus as the Savior. And when you have the wisdom of faith, 
Well, that changes the way you look at stuff. Why would you bring all those expensive gifts and give it to an insignificant family and a tiny little child? God's grace gave them the wisdom to understand what the world finds valuable are nothing more than trinkets without the Savior, but in the hands of believers, they're tools. Tools to give glory to a loving God who saved us. It changes the way you look at things. And God's grace gives us the wisdom to view our lives differently, too. To do things that the world finds senseless. Think about these men from far, far away, trekking across the globe, following a star in search of the Savior. So what is it that you see? What is it you see when you look at the image? Not the one on page 11 of your worship folder, but the one that appears on the pages of Matthew's Gospel. Who is this baby? Born in Bethlehem in a manger on the night of his birth, now having moved into the big house. Well, the sad truth is there are times when we, just like Herod, view him as a threat. Because we want to be in charge of our lives. We want to make decisions about our future. And sometimes it appears to us, because we are the sinful people we are, that Jesus is the one who stands in the way of our supposed happiness. And so we want to snuff him out. Like Herod, who tried to snuff out the life of Jesus by commanding that all the baby boys two years old and younger in the surrounding countryside should be slaughtered. There are times when we're like that. And there are moments when we see him as insignificant, like the experts, the teachers of the law. We're content to know a few details about Jesus, maybe even meditate on them and contemplate them a little bit, but always keeping him at an arm's distance, never wanting him to make too much of an intrusion into our lives. Yeah, there are times when I see him as insignificant, and you do too. But what's so fascinating to me is God would take people like you and me and connect us to a Savior. You see, what we really deserve is not to be drawn to the Savior, but to be allowed to continue to wander away from Him, to continue to see Him as insignificant, and even try to snuff Him out of our lives. And yet God gives us the wisdom to correctly identify Jesus for the Savior that He is. He's the one that the Father sent into this world to live under his law in holiness for me. He's the one who offered his perfect life as a sacrifice on the cross, poured out God's holy blood to wash away my sin. God, by his grace, gives me that wisdom. God, by his grace, gives you the wisdom to see that he's the one that died the death that you were supposed to die. He's the one that occupied the grave that belonged to you. He's the one that went to hell for you to proclaim victory. And he rose from the dead so that you could have the promise and assurance of life. That's not smart thinking. That's not keen insight on your part. That is the grace of God's epiphany. Revelation to you that that child is in fact your Savior, God in human flesh, sent to rescue you. And that, just like the wise men, changes your life. Why are you here today? The world around you finds value in something entirely different than you do. You find it valuable to be here today. The rest of the world is valuing their weekend to recharge their batteries. They're getting ready for kickoff. And yet you're here today because you understand the importance of re-energizing your soul by God's promises. That's God's grace at work. 
Grace enabling you to find valuable what the world finds valueless. And not only has he revealed the true identity of Jesus, he's led us to this place again. After bringing us to faith, he's led us right here. Amazing. By God's grace, he not only shows us who the Savior is and shows us what's truly valuable, he empowers us to order our lives so that they follow his priorities, to make our will bend to his. Do you see a rabbit or a duck? Truth is, that probably doesn't really matter. I don't know if it says anything about your creativity or your quick wit. But the fact that you see in this baby, in a house in Bethlehem, your Savior, your Rescuer, your Redeemer, that is all of God's grace. Grace that gives you wisdom. Grace that enables you to find valuable what the world finds worthless. Grace that empowers you to mold your lives and to bend to his will. God, thank you for that grace. And may you go home today rejoicing in that grace, content to not only give him some trinkets of worship for a moment, but to give him your hearts, to give him your lives, to give him your praise every moment of every day. God help us. Amen. Please stand.